I'd like to do is obviously thank the mayor for being here, and uh, first and foremost, of course, but also also thank the administration for uh, being here. The pre um, and I'd like to introduce Associate Vice President uh, Dean Fred, Ro uh, Dr. Fred Rocco, and we'll then introduce the mayor. Thank you, folks. Thank you all for coming. It is certainly my pleasure on behalf of Jack Sprague, our president, and Sarah Garrett, our chief academic officer, who do send their regrets. They are tied up in another it's meeting for a few okay. hours yet, so they do send their apologies. Certainly it is my pleasure to introduce a very strong supporter of this college and our students here, uh, Mayor Will Flanagan. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. They, they put a microphone on me, I believe that's for recordings. Can everybody hear me in the back okay? Excellent. If you can't, just let me know and I'll raise the volume of my voice. First, let me begin by saying it's an honor uh, for me to be back here. And I was here last semester, I believe, uh, speaking to a similar class about government and civic engagement and what we're doing here in the city of Fall River. And just by a quick show of hands, how many folks live here in Fall River? It's almost half the class. And greater Fall River area? Probably the remaining. And first, I want to begin by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, born and raised in the city of Fall River, elected to office at the age of 29. Mayor has been the first office that I have held, elected office. Uh, went to Diamond Vocational, where I studied electronics. After graduating uh, from Diamond, I went on to UMass Dartmouth, where I majored in sociology and criminal justice. At the time, I thought I wanted to become a police officer. I even took some uh, courses here at BCC focused on criminal justice. Uh, but sometime in my senior year of college, I made a decision to go on to law school. So I took my LSATs. I didn't even know what they were when I showed up to take them. I just knew it was a test I had to take before I uh, could get into law school. So w I remember as, as if it was yesterday, it was at Bridgewater State College and I went there uh, during the fall and took the L LSATs and I scored pretty well on them and I ended up going to Roger Williams Law School which is over in Bristol, Rhode Island. I lived here in Fall River and I would make the commute, about a 20 minute commute every day where I went full time days. After graduating from law school, uh, I made a decision uh, to enter into public service. And I was hired as the assistant attorney uh, for the city of Taunton. And that was a position that I enjoyed to do. It allowed me uh, to uh, be involved in both government and law at the same time. I was able to uh, issue legal opinions uh, to the mayor and to the city council and work with the police chief and the fire chief and the various departments that were incorporated into city government. Then in 2006, 2007, I was appointed as an assistant district attorney here in Bristol County. And it was my responsibility to supervise both the Fall River and Taunton district courts. And I would go into the courtroom uh, on a daily basis to prosecute criminal cases. And I handled everything from uh, armed robberies to uh, sexual assault crimes, to assault and batteries, to drunk driving. And it was, it was another job that I really enjoyed and it allowed me to interact with the public. And I always found it gratifying uh, to be involved in public service. Then in 2009, I was discontent uh, with the way I saw our city government going. And I uh, decided that I was going to run for mayor. And back in 2001 and 2003, I ran for school committee. Uh, it wasn't successful. Uh, don't even think, uh, I made it past the primary both times uh, due to probably the lack of candidates, which gave me a, a free pass into November. But during those 2001, 2003 elections, uh, I didn't win. However, it was a good experience for me. It allowed me to see the whole process of campaigning. It allowed me to get into the community. And it kept me abreast of the issues uh, that were going on here in the city of Fall River. So in 2009, I had my first organizational meeting, and I remember it. it was about maybe four or five people in the room. Mostly of them were either family or friends, and uh, we decided that we're going to launch a campaign for mayor. And you know, I say it started off as a whisper uh, before we decided to run, and as the campaign grew on, it grew into a chorus uh, because we finished in the top two in the preliminary in 2009. 
and in the general election we won with over 60 percent of the vote. And the type of campaign that we ran was a grassroots campaign. I think one of the reasons why we were so successful was due to the fact of our visibility. I made it a point that every day after work I would go out door knocking. So I would get the voter list and I would see uh, who was on the voter list and I would spend you know, my time I got after work to the time the sun went down knocking on doors and talking to people. So I would go block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, precinct by precinct, ward by ward, uh, talking to the voters, going to their house, knocking on their door. And it wasn't really a practice uh, that was subscribed to by most uh, politicians here in Fall River. Uh, and we were doing something that has been done in other places of our nation or our globe, but really wasn't practiced here in the city. And I would go talk to people, you know, knock on your door, talk to you, find out what issues that you were concerned with. And it was those issues that the people, the voters that they were concerned with, became the platform of our campaign. So by talking to people, interacting with people, we, we knew what the issues were. So when we would go out and do our issue papers or focus on what we were going to be accomplishing during the campaign, uh, we knew what we were talking about because we had our finger on the pulse of the community. So we won. And uh, believe it or not, when you walk into the mayor's office, there's no manual on how to be a mayor. Uh, you know, you put your suit on, you walk into the office, you got your first appointment, uh, but there's no manual telling you what you do once you become elected. Most of it's common sense, and most of it's interacting with people and taking advice from people. So since becoming elected, you know, that we've dealt with a number of issues. And we're just coming into our second year of our first term, and Mayor in Fall River is a two-year term, so we're already up for re-election. And the issues we're dealing with here in Fall River are really the same issues that people are dealing with globally. Turn on any news channel, pick up any newspaper, and you see that the issues are really the same. We're dealing with unemployment issues here in Fall River. We're dealing with public safety. We're dealing with educational issues. We're dealing with community development issues. And some of the issues are site specific to our community, but most of all, they're issues that cities and towns face no matter where you're standing on a globe. And I'll go through them briefly with you, but most importantly, I want to turn this discussion over to you to answer your questions uh, to see what's on your mind. So with economic development, City of Fall River has the second highest unemployment rate in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The employment statistics were just released yesterday and we're hovering around 17 percent. Uh, highest is Lawrence, they're about 17.6 percent. Population of Fall River is roughly 88,000 people, so you can do the math. 17% unemployment, population of 88,000 people. And one of the reasons I believe uh, which has led to high levels of unemployment is the uh, disbanding, disbanding of the textile industry. At one time in Fall River, your grandparents or your parents were either working at Duro or Quaker or Light O'Lear, and they were making good money. Uh, the money to pay their mortgage, money to pay their car payments, money to put away for your college education. And those jobs at one time in our history closed their doors and they either went overseas or down south for cheaper labor. And when the Quakers started closing their doors and the Duro started laying off people and Light O'Lear started reducing its workforce, we saw the number of people going to the career center increasing. And we saw the unemployment statistics start creeping up. And just recently, we saw 850 people who were laid off at A.J. Wright. Now, those individuals, through no fault of their own, lost their job because that company, TJX, made a decision that they weren't making enough profit. So they closed their doors and 850 more people went into the unemployment lines. And just last month, we had a trades fair here at BCC and we had about 600 people show up with their resumes looking for work. And 
I didn't know if I should feel happy that we had 600 people actively engaged looking for work or that I should feel sad that we had so many people who could not find work in our community. I walked away feeling sad because you saw so many people who didn't have a high school diploma or had a high school diploma, no college education. For some of them, English was their second language. And they're citizens here in Fall River. Many of them are maybe your neighbors or family members. And they can't find work. So we're doing the best we can to attract as many job opportunities to our city. Working with the Career Center, working with the Workforce Investment Board, working with the former Office of Economic Development, on a daily basis, we're recruiting companies to come to our city. Uh, we were able to bring in Lato Lear to Fall River, uh, who is going to be making, hopefully, some more job improvements here. We saw a TPI come into our city, who is going to be manufacturing wind turbines on our waterfront. So we're slowly bringing in the companies that are going to helpfully create the jobs. But what I've been most excited about has been our development in technology. And for those of you who've been following what's been going on here in the city of Fall River, uh, we had the creation of our technology park along Route 24. And working with the University of Massachusetts, uh, we will be constructing a biomanufacturing facility, which we hope will act as a magnet to biomanufacturing and technology companies. Now, not everybody who works in that bio park is going to be a scientist or a doctor. There are a number of jobs, whether it be clerical or administrative, that will be going into that park, but also the temporary construction jobs that that's going to create for those in the building trades. So that's a step in the right direction. Uh, we're also planning improvements to our waterfront. And within the next several days, I'm going to be releasing a waterfront district improvement plan given potential investors and property owners zoning as of right. And just to give you a quick overview, uh, if you want to build something here in Fall River or, or change zoning, you have to go for what's called a special permit. And you go in front of the zoning board, and you, if, you're, look, if you're a property owner or investor, you apply for a special permit. But what I hear from investors is that you have to go to this board, then you have to go to that board, then you have to go to this hearing, then you have to go to that hearing, then somebody objects, the next thing you know you've got to hire an attorney and you go to go to court, and maybe five years later you get to build a project you intentionally wanted to build from day one. I'm looking to streamline that so investors know that they can come to our city and that they can build something and not get tied up in red tape. So hopefully with this improvement plan, we make an investment in our waterfront, you have construction jobs coming in, you have executive jobs coming in, you have administrative jobs coming in, and it's one more tool in the toolbox which I hope will spur economic development here in our city and leads to the uh, long-term recovery that our city needs. Focus a little bit on public safety with you. Uh, since when I, the forward police department, police force, hovers around 200 officers. If you went back maybe 15 years ago, our police department was hovering around 250 police officers. So given the last decade and a half, our police department numbers have come down. A lot of that has to do with the economy and funding. So public safety is a key component, I believe, to any successful society or any successful community. And since taking office, we've made some major improvements in public safety. We're able to hire back 13 police <coughs> officers, which we've put on walking beats, because I believe it's important to have our police visible in the community. And we put them in some of the hot spots in our community, whether it be the Flint, Corky Row, or our downtown, where you have police officers walking the streets, interacting with neighbors, interacting with our youth, interacting with our business owners. It gives a sense of safety in the community. But like any urban community, we have our issues. We have those who engage in uh, drug dealing. Uh, we have those who engage in gangs. Uh, so we have issues in our city, like any city does. But working with our police department, we try to our best to combat those issues and be as proactive as possible uh, to make sure that people have a sense of safety in their community, 
Uh, the senior citizen can walk the streets without being in fear of being mugged, or a mother can take her children to the parks or playgrounds without being in fear of becoming a victim of a crime. So I believe in public safety, and I'm working daily with our police chief, Dan Racine, uh, to do the best we can to improve public safety. And also want to touch with you upon education. We made some great strides in education here in Fall River. Uh, when I took office, our graduation rate was hovering around 50 percent. Our graduation rate right now is around 66 percent. So within the last 15 months, we saw an increase in our graduation rate. We also saw a decrease in our dropout rate. We have schools like Dispenser Borden Elementary School uh, who, for the last two years, has reached AYP in both math and English language arts. Uh, we see very active and engaged uh, PTOs throughout our school district. But even those achievements we've made, I recognized, are not enough. And the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, who is the state overseer of our school district, is working with us to make improvements in our school district. Because I, like probably all of you, believe that in order to improve the quality of life here in Fall River, we have to improve our school system. I just want to go over some statistics with you. Average single income in the city of Fall River is $15,000 or less. 10% of our population or less has a bachelor's degree or higher. And one in five people are living below the poverty line. So those statistics are very alarming. You know, we are a poor community economically but go to any block or any neighborhood in our city and you can see that we are a rich community in hard work. We're a community that has family values. We're a community who knows the, uh, what it takes to work hard and achieve. But generationally, we've never really had those high educational attainment levels. And I go back to the textile industry. I think at one time somebody could drop out of high school, go to work in the textile industry, get a good paying job and still provide for their families. Unfortunately, through no fault of our own, those textile jobs are no longer there. So the people who dropped out, the people who were relying upon those jobs don't have them anymore and they're finding it more and more difficult to get a job. And I remember just last year, I was here at BCC uh, for those individuals who were graduating and getting their high school diploma. And it was so moving to hear some of their stories and why the reasons why they dropped out of high school, whether it was to take care of a child or to take care of a family member or to, earn a, to get a job uh, to provide for their family. But more and more we see individuals <coughs> recognizing that they have to go back to school to get their education in order to successfully compete in today's job market. And the last subject that I want to talk to you about before I turn it over is, you know, what we're trying to do here in government. You know, most importantly, I think, besides attracting jobs, besides improving education, besides improving public safety, is improving our image. You know, raising the self-esteem of people, raising the hope of people, letting people know that it's okay to say you're from Fall River. You know, it bothers me sometimes when you go out outside the city and people look down upon the city that we've come from. For many of us, this is our birthplace. We've called Fall River home and we'll continue to call Fall River home uh, for the rest of our lives. So I think it's up to all of us to do what we can to improve our city's image. And it's one of the things that I talked about at our state of the city is that it takes people working together to make improvements and no matter what subject you're talking about, it takes people coming together. It takes government working with citizens, working with the private sector, working with nonprofits, doing what you can to give a hand up to people. So that's what we've been doing in government, and this is how I've gotten here. But at this time, I'd like to turn it over to you to have a free discussion for the next 30 minutes or so uh, to talk about uh, what's on your mind and what you're doing here in class and how it may pertain uh, to what's going on in government. So who's brave enough to ask the first question? Yes. I'm also a uh, small business owner. 
What type of business? Uh, I do carpet sales and installation. Okay. I actually took it over at the company for my dad who passed away two years ago. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. So, uh, one, I just wanted to thank you for coming. And two, I know the city hall is in desperate need of carpet. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> If you, if you can give me your card or get it to me, it'd be greatly appreciated. <laughs> That's the man who's going to go places right there. Exactly. Next question. I'm Keith Wilkinson. I am in Mr. Kilkerson's government class. Um, I just started attending BCC. My question to you is regarding public safety. Yes. Um, you said that in the last 10 years or so. Approximately. We had 250 and we cut down to 200 Correct. police officers. And we lost them to a lot of surrounding communities who were hiring police officers. Mm -hmm. Now, with the growing crime rate, crime rate, population, the increased Section 8 housing, and low-income families that were taken from other communities, mm -hmm. and then here, do you think that's helping us or hurting us? And is 13 police officers enough? 13, you can never have enough police officers protecting a community. But we, I think we also need to be mindful. You can have a million police officers on and it still may not prevent crimes from occurring. Uh, some of the crimes we see that occur, the police officers could have been present and still not have been able to stop that crime from happening. But I think what's most important is that we continue to reduce the fear of crime. And that's something that our police chief, Dan Racine, talks about uh, consistently. Sometimes the fear of crime is worse than crime itself. And there are a number of factors, I believe, that lead into crime. Many of them are prevalent here in the city of Fall River. Somebody loses their job, which we see people happening. They may turn to a life of crime. Somebody develops a alcohol addiction or a drug addiction, they may turn to a life of crime. It's those factors uh, that I believe lead to criminal activity. And not just focusing on the police issue, we've taken on a number of initiatives to help those who may be dealing with drug addiction or alcohol addiction or uh, mental health illness. And just earlier today, I was over at STAR. And STAR, for those of you who don't know, is located on Stanley Street uh, here in Fall River. And they do a number of initiatives helping individuals with those uh, uh, characteristics that we were just speaking about. And one of the programs that we were able to initiate through a federal grant was sending caseworkers out into the community and identifying people who have just lost their job or who were just in danger of losing their job because what statistics show is that those individuals may develop a depression. Depression may lead to divorce, it may lead to substance abuse, it may lead to criminal activity. So by sending caseworkers out into the community working with our nonprofits, working with our hospital settings, we're hoping to identify individuals early on and act as a safety net for them uh, to prevent them from developing addictions or stopping them from growing into an illness or hopefully preventing them from committing a criminal activity. But we're doing what we can to bring back our police force. Now the officers who were recently laid off, we've brought back or giving an opportunity for them to come back to our city. But you're right, some of them found employment in other communities. So public safety is a major issue. It's an issue that's on the forefront of our administration and we're doing what we can to restore our police department, reducing that fear of crime. But the last point I wanna retouch upon is you can have 300, 400, 500 police officers, and that still may not stop crime from occurring. It's important to identify the factors that cause crime and start reducing them also, bringing more jobs to Fall River. 
uh, improving access to health care for those who have a mental illness can get it diagnosed and have it treated. Uh, doing what we can to reduce drug and alcohol addiction. So by identifying the causes or the root of crime and doing what you can to minimize those risk factors, you also help reduce criminal activity from occurring. I also believe educational attainment levels uh, are a direct correlation to criminal activity. I believe the more we do to improve our school system, the more people we can, students we can stop from dropping out and joining a gang or hanging out on the street corner, uh, the less criminal activity we will see occurring. And one of the great programs we have here in Fall River is Youth Build. Anybody know what Youth Build is? We have one, one student in the back. Youth Build is an organization made mostly of volunteers and some grant money who identifies students who are dropped out of school or who are in danger of dropping out of school. Many of them may have already joined a gang or been involved in the criminal justice system and has taken them out of those lifestyles and bringing them into a family that cares for them. When I mean family, I mean a family of their peers or a family of mentors. And Youth Build has been doing some great work here in Fall River. If you take a ride by Rodman Street in our city, you see a house that Youth Build is building. And that house is being built and is going to go to a first time home buyer who has a disability and the house is handicap accessible. Uh, Youth Build does a number of volunteer projects in the city and during the last snowstorm uh, they were going out shoveling driveways for those uh, citizens who were elderly or who suffered from a disability. So it's creating social programs, getting our youth involved, increasing educational attainment levels, identifying risk factors that I believe will help reduce criminal activity from occurring, but also making sure that you have an adequate police department who is well trained and staffed in numbers. Another question? Right up front. Good morning. Mr. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joanne Field, and I'm a criminal justice major, and mm -hmm. I'm also in Professor Kilgore's um, class. My question is um, kind of a, a unique. Um, I wanted to know what the city's policy was if, for, say, example, one of the hate groups like the Westboro Baptist Church mm -hmm. came in and wanted to protest um, a, fr a funeral of one of Fall River's fallen heroes. Mm -hmm. Did everybody hear the question? Good question. And we've, since taking office in January, I've attended approximately five uh, fallen soldier funerals. And we have the highest per capita military debts uh, within the last year, more than Boston. And these funeral services have shown an outpouring of people in the community who have come to pay their respect to these fallen heroes. And I have not seen any protests occurring at these funerals. However, we have a police presence at them. Uh, we have a presence of dignitaries and citizens at these funerals. Um, and we would not let the funerals be disrupted uh, because not only are they solemn, but they're also an opportunity uh, for the family to grieve and for the community to grieve. Uh, but, so I'm not sure of any policy we have drafted. However, I can assure you that we would not let these funerals ever be disrupted and we would allow our community and the family of the fallen hero uh, to grieve in whatever manner they chose to grieve in. Do you know of any examples? No, I mean, not locally. Right. But I was just curious, because right now I'm doing a um, honest project about mm -hmm. um, the conflict of that. With sure. The comparison of how the protests went in the 60s for the Vietnam War in comparison to the hate crimes well, what I consider a hate crime by these groups that are um, protesting military funerals. Right. Luckily, for their own agenda. luckily, we haven't seen it happen here in Fall River, but I do know it's happened elsewhere throughout our nation. If you want, uh, you can contact Ray Haig, who's our veterans agent, mm -hmm. and you can also probably contact Chief Dan Racine.
I'm sure either individual will be more than happy to sit down with you so you can get perspective from the veterans agent, but also our police chief, and it may help you in writing your paper. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Holly, Hi, once Holly. the new bus station opens, yes. will there be any increased safety measures in downtown in that area? Question was, once the new bus station opens, will there be any increase in public safety? Yes. We have a walking beat in our city's downtown. Uh, that walking beat police officer will be around <laughs> the bus station area. Currently, he or she is not, but with the station open, uh, we will have somebody walking within that particular area. And I'm really excited about the new bus station. Uh, for those of you who've seen what we have now, it's a temporary location. It's a trailer, uh, and it's in our city's downtown. <laughs> uh, we're, gonna, we're breaking ground this year on a new bus station. It's going to be a LEED certified building. It's going to be uh, environmentally friendly and it's going to be hopefully state-of-the-art and it's something that's long overdue here in our city and it, we're seeing the city's downtown start making a revitalization not as quick as I want it to but we see it moving we've seen a number of new businesses come down to our cities downtown restaurants coffee shops uh, newspaper stands a lot of, of that has to do with the opening of the new courthouse brings in more foot traffic in our city's downtown. This spring and summer, we're going to be renewing our commitment uh, to a farmer's market uh, in our city's downtown. I encourage you all to attend if you can, where we get our local farmers uh, from the greater Fall River, greater New Bedford area, down to the farmer's market, and they sell produce and vegetables. Uh, and it's an opportunity uh, that we have to bring more foot traffic in our city's downtown, more foot traffic increase business, increase business, expands our, hopefully our tax base, leads to a greater quality of life here in our city. So that's one of the initiatives that we're doing. Our downtown, our waterfront's very important. And yes, we will have our walking beat officer in that area. Another question? In the back. Yes. Sure. Um, I'm a big supporter of commuter rail. In fact, I'm calling upon our governor and our senators and our congressmen to make even a more of a push for commuter rail. I've been following what's been going on nationally, and the state of Florida just passed on one to two billion dollars in money that they had federally funded for them for high-speed rail projects. I'm hoping that we here in Massachusetts can capitalize on that funding and bring it here, especially the South Coast, uh, to expand our commuter rail. The Army Corps of Engineers was conducting a study on what the possible routes could be for a commuter rail. They had the Attleboro route, they had the Stoughton route, and they had a high-speed bus lane. I favor the Stoughton route, and that's the route that was adopted, uh, hopefully, by the Army Corps of Engineers. It's been the route that's been adopted by our governor. It would extend commuter rail from Boston into Taunton, and then have two rail lines, one going to Fall River, one going to New Bedford. Fall River would have two stations. Taunton would have two stations. So that project has been moving forward, but as we can all guess, one of the roadblocks to South Coast Rail is funding. Where are the finances going to come from to continue to fund this project and see it to completion? Right now, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is facing a one to two billion dollar budget deficit. So we're probably going to see cuts coming down to cities and towns like Fall River, like New Bedford, like Taunton. A lot of those cuts will be in education, uh, social services, public safety. So whenever time our state government makes a cut, we feel the ramifications here in Fall River probably more so than surrounding towns. So South Coast Rail is moving forward. It's, a route has been selected. The studies continue to move on, 
but one of the major hurdles or roadblocks that has to be overcome is funding it. That's why I called upon our uh, congressional leaders and our governor to make a pitch for that federal funding that Florida just passed up. Hopefully we can get it, use it, and help fund our project. That's, uh, that will be determined at a later date. I think we've got time for one more question. Right down front. Um, hi, my name is Jillian Zula and I'm in Human Services. One of my concerns is with all the budget cuts with health care, um, recently MassHealth has cut me back on a lot of services. Mm -hmm. And that concerns me because like, if I need to go to the hospital, they're not going to cover me. If I need my wheelchair to be repaired, they won't refuse me. Um, do you know of any or, like organizations that would be able to help? Or? Sure. And we have a very good local delegation. Senator Michael Rodericks, Representatives David Sullivan, Paul Schmidt, and Kevin Aguiar are up in Beacon Hill, and I know especially Dave Sullivan fights for this on a daily basis, uh, doing the best they can to make sure cuts are not made in the healthcare field. Uh, last week I was with SEIU 1199 fighting to make sure that the personal care attendants are not cut. Uh, personal care attendants are individuals who I believe are really doing God's work. Uh, they help individuals who have a disability or illness remain in their home and they give them the care they need in their house so these individuals don't have to go to an assisted living facility or to a nursing home and they potentially can see a cut. Also Townhouse in the city of Fall River, a organization that helps uh, individuals who have a mental illness may also be facing a cut at the state level. And when those cuts are made or those programs are, are closed, individuals who rely upon them are greatly affected. So I am working with our state delegation to do the best we can here to make sure that those programs aren't cut because we recognize the importance of them. So I would encourage you uh, to contact Mike Rodericks or Representative Sullivan or, or Aguiar or Schmidt to voice your concerns to them because they're our voice in Beacon Hill. Okay. If those cuts come down, they're going to be coming down from Boston and you and I feel them. So I remain vocal, uh, contact our state representatives and our senator to let them know how th those cuts will directly affect you. So when they testify on Beacon Hill, and you may even have an opportunity to go up to Boston to testify yourself, when they're making decisions, they know how you feel and they know how those decisions affect people. And that's something I always encourage. Uh, our senators, our representatives, our congressmen don't know unless we tell them. You know, it's our, you know, they have a responsibility to educate themselves on the issues, but we also have a responsibility to let them know as their constituency how these cuts will affect us. So when they're in Boston or they're in Washington, D.C., they can tell our stories to the people who are making the decision and how their decisions and the votes they take are directly affecting the people back in their district. And if enough of our stories are told, hopefully we can preserve and protect what we're trying to preserve and protect. Uh, I want to thank all of you for allowing me to come here. I always find this informative and I enjoy uh, speaking uh, to those in education who are studying uh, because I recognize how important it is uh, to receive your education and to uh, enter the job market. And I applaud all of you for continuing your higher education. I hope you don't stop with an associate's. I hope you continue to go on to get your bachelor's, your master's, and your doctorates and achieve your dreams, achieve your goals, and be successful uh, as you foresee yourself being. So thank you all for allowing me to come to your class this morning to speak with you, and I really enjoyed it, so thank you.